being across the table from one of the most beautiful women I had ever seen physically from the outside. And yet looking into her eyes, she had no soul. And she was telling me that she was selling grooming virgins to sell for $7,500 a piece. I said, how on earth could this person so beautiful on the outside be so evil and dead on the inside? I could not believe it. Tradesmen built America, not policymakers or desk jockeys, but hardworking blue collared men and women. Join me, Roger Wakefield, on conversations with some of the nation's most successful skilled laborers. This is The Trade Talks. So tell me what the craziest thing you've ever seen is. Well, I tell you, I go back and forth thinking about with Operation Underground Railroad, some of our operations. I would say the craziest thing for me was on one occasion in Mexico, in Acapulco, Mexico, being across the table from one of the most beautiful women I had ever seen physically from the outside. And yet looking into her eyes, she had no soul. And she was telling me that she was selling grooming virgins to sell for $7,500 a piece. I said, how on earth could this person so beautiful on the outside be so evil and dead on the inside? I could not believe it. Fortunately, we were able to end up saving those kids. Did you end up how she became that evil? I never got found out. So I never got her full story, but what's fascinating about it is that about two weeks after we met with her, we set up an undercover operation. We were all ready to go. Then she called and said, I can't deliver on that date that I said, the product I was going to bring, because my daughter just had a ruptured appendix and I have to take her to Mexico City Mm -hmm. to be in the hospital. She's my whole world. I'll drop everything for her. She's six years old. And I thought, wait a sec. Here she is grooming and selling 12-year-olds, 13-year-olds, and yet at the same time is this great mother, doting mother. I mean, what kind of world do we live in, Roger? This is just crazy. I, I don't. The first time I saw you speak and saw your short video that, that, that you showed at mm-hmm. Connect, I was literally like, I, I mean, I, I'm sitting there at the time, tears running down my face. I'm, I'm like, how, how is our world like this? Right. I don't remember if it was that one or the next time, but... Y'all had a piece about this guy. I think this guy made 10 bucks an hour, but he'd save up his money. And once every year or two, he's going to some third world country to be with a 12 year old kid. Cartagena, Colombia. That was Dennis De Jesus, who was arrested by the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Exactly what you said. Worked at, I think, a night officer, security officer when he's overnight, $10 an hour would save up his money for once a year, once every two years, just as you said. Is this not crazy, this kind of depravity, that that's what he would save his money for? That blew my mind. Mm. When I saw that, and we're, we're going to talk a minute because I'm in the trades. Yes. Literally sitting in the crowd watching you speak the first time I heard you speak, and I got to talk to you about it later. I said, look, the whole time I'm watching this, I owned a service plumbing company at the time. And I'm like, there's got to be a thing that trades people can do. I don't know how many trades people there are in the United States that, that are service people. Okay. Plumbers, electricians, HVAC techs, roofers, wh- wh- whatever it is, that walk into people's houses every day. And I got this idea because I used to be part of Green Plumbers USA. Okay. The, the, the drought in Australia was so bad, they got together and said, look, plumbers walk in more people's houses every day than anybody else. Yep. And they know water. Let, let's teach them. And they changed it. Yeah. They taught people about high efficiency and aerators and toilets. And look, let's learn to save water. And this is even bigger. Right. But I thought about it that day. A normal plumber, any, any service person, walks in 420 houses a year. Wow, that many. Yep. I could see Imagine that. how many millions, because I, I know there's, there, there's got to be two, three, four million. You take that number in half because part of them are new construction, part of them are service. Right. If you took 2 million people that walk into 420 houses a year, they've got to see some. Mm-hmm. But first of all, t- tell everybody who you are and what you do. <laughs> Matt Osborne. I grew up in North Texas, not too far from where we are right now. I always wanted to, I, you know, I'll be honest. I fell in love with the James Bond movies, the Jason Bourne movies. I'm not anywhere near as cool as those guys, but I really wanted to do something overseas, international, using languages. 
I'm also very patriotic, not just a patriotic Texan, but patriotic American. Wanted to do something to serve our country. So this idea of maybe going one day to work for the CIA, I thought that was pretty cool. Well, when I graduated from college in the early 90s, I applied back then. I mean, you'll remember it was the type up your resume, go to Kinko's or Office Max, the cover letter, mail it in. Well, I never heard back. It wasn't until the year 2000 when I was in California in graduate school studying international relations, international studies, that the CIA recruiters came to campus. So I started talking to them, working with them. Well, after the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, they were hiring and I was able to get on with the CIA. I worked issues of weapons of mass destruction, of, um, of chemical and biological weapons proliferation, the war in Iraq when that started, terrorism against the homeland, a whole bunch of different topics. Well, I wanted to go overseas and I didn't want to take my family to the Middle East. I was too dangerous. I didn't speak Arabic, but I got an amazing opportunity to go to Madrid, Spain, to learn Spanish, to take my family and to work on issues of, again, terrorism, organized crime, drug trafficking, and this thing, Roger, and I'd never heard of in 2006 called human trafficking. I thought it was prostitution, the movie Pretty Woman. They make it seem like the Julia Roberts character decided when, how much, with who. You bet. That's not true. There's always a pimp. There's a trafficker. So I didn't know exactly what was happening then. I think maybe God was kind of helping me get this, this experience with the CIA, but also learning about human trafficking. After a post in Madrid, then I went to Venezuela to work for a year. Then I went to Mexico City to work for three years. Well, that's when my former graduate school colleague, Tim Ballard, who was with CIA and then with Homeland Security, he says, Matt, I have this crazy idea to leave the government. I leave our careers after 12 years and start an organization where we empower law enforcement in the United States and around the world to fight human trafficking. I said, well, Tim, you know, I don't know because Uncle Sam pays me faithfully twice a month. I've got my government pension waiting for me in just six years if I stick it out. And you want me to leave all that and join an organization where I only get paid if the donations come in? He said, yes, that's exactly what I'm asking. So I thought about it. I talked about my to my wife and she said, well, I trust you, I guess. It seems kind of risky. And my father said, Matt, you know, I wouldn't do it. There are few, so few companies that even give pensions anymore. Stick it out and then go do it. Well, for me, it was my two daughters, Annie and Grace, who are now college age, but back then they were very young. And I thought if this horror of human trafficking and child exploitation is happening to their age or younger, I've got to do something. So in 2014, in August, I resigned from the CIA, U.S. Department of State, and joined Operation Underground Railroad and have been there the past 10 years. The Sound of Freedom is Tim learning about rescuing these two kids. He rescues more than that. Correct. But that's where he's like, look, we, we need to start something. Exactly. The bureaucracy, the restraints had kind of gotten to him. You're right. I've seen, I've seen clips from Operation Underground Railroad, not, mm -hmm. not, not the movie version. Correct. But I've seen the, the movie real, also. yeah. <laughs> but I've seen clips, and it's not just bad guys. There's politicians involved. Oh, yeah. Where's the first place you said you went? Venezuela? Uh, for with the government with Spain, Venezuela, with Operation Underground Railroad, it's Colombia. Okay, but 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 still, Venezuela. How many Americans go to Venezuela to go on vacation every year? Fewer now with the insecurity, but they're still beautiful areas. But it's the American sex tourist who is going to these areas, like the person you mentioned earlier, Dennis De Jesus, who is going to Cartagena, Colombia, with many other Americans to do that. And, and we're talking Colombia, Mexico. This isn't just third world countries. Correct. This is, these are our neighbors. Exactly. And there's politicians involved in these countries. Right. I saw, I saw the, 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 the presentation you did. Y'all are going to hit two big houses at one time. Mm -hmm. One went, the other didn't. And at one point, y'all are like, look, we can't even get out of here. I know. That was in Haiti. <laughs> uh, yeah. Matter of fact, uh, Elizabeth Carnegie works with me. Yes, uh, yes. I think you know her. From yes, Austin I do. Networks. Yeah, she's great. And she's like, there's certain countries you can't even go into now, aren't there? Yeah. How come? Because not only is it the bad guys, as you mentioned, but it's the good guys, the host governments with whom we're, we're working. And you asked a lot of great questions as well. You know, Sound of Freedom is the founding story of Operation Underground Railroad. And Tim Ballard with Homeland Security was doing amazing work arresting U.S. pedophiles, American pedophiles, rescuing American kids. But if there wasn't a U.S. tie, a U.S. nexus to the case, he could not rescue the kids, all the kids who were out there. And in the movie, you'll remember... His boss says, Tim, we're Homeland Security. We can't go off rescuing Honduran kids in Colombia. Right. Well, he said, I don't want these constraints, these restraints. 
I believe I can help empower to rescue all the kids. And that's why he, when he started our organization. So we're not a vigilante group. We go in through the front door. We don't go in at all. However, with corruption in some of these countries, we have to be very careful with whom are we working, which units. We work with units, only units vetted by the U.S. Embassy, but the U.S. Embassy often cannot assist us because they're under the same restraints and constraints that Tim was under. Hey, sorry, we can't help you, but this is the unit to work with. So the operation you mentioned was called Operation Sage's Prayer in Haiti, where we worked with the Haitian National Police to take down a big Haitian and Dominican trafficker who was bringing Venezuelan girls into the country. Well, he was such a big trafficker that he quickly bought off the national police with whom we had just been working a couple of days earlier. So for the next five days after that operation, we're running not only from the bad guys, but from the good guys. And as Liz Carnegie is correct in saying, we can't really go back to Haiti anymore to work. We do some things on the fringes, but it's very dangerous. How do you put your teams together? Uh, I, and I know you've, you've got a lot of former military, right? When you're in a situation like that, you better know how to get away from everybody. You got to get away. Oh, from. Yeah. How do you pick people to work with you? And do they come to you? Do you seek them out? How, how do right. you do that? It is really neat to see how we've evolved over really about the past nine years. So what we say is we were founded in late 2013. Our first operations were early 2014. Really in that the early days, it was just basically Tim Ballard and who he knew. He had a couple of people he knew from uh, Special Forces, Homeland Security. He got me out of the CIA. Well, we've grown now with resources and thanks to opportunities like this to talk about donations and way to support Operation Underground Railroad. We now have six regions around the world. We say that the sun never sets on the OUR area of responsibility. The lights are always on somewhere. Asia, Africa and the Middle East, Europe. South America, Central America, Mexico, and the Caribbean, those are our international regions. And then we have one in the U.S. we can talk to, talk about soon because, you know, I love here about the trade talks and we talk about people in the trade services. There is a lot that they can do that we'll discuss. But now our regions are run by some of the most qualified men and women you could ever hope for. 20-year veterans of law enforcement, homeland security, a tier one Navy SEAL. We have a woman who was 18 years with the U.S. Department of Justice who was prosecuting some of the early cases, including the two cases in Sound of Freedom, if you remember from the two American pedophiles, mm -hmm. Oshinsky and Bachman. Their real names are Lupachensky and Buchanan, but those two she prosecuted. She came to us after finishing up some Jeffrey Epstein prosecutions in terms of victim restitution. So we have these amazing men and women. That's how we put our teams together. Then we have amazing contractors who could do this. They could be getting paid $1,000 a day on the open market for their skills. They'll say, eh, 100 bucks a day, or you know what? Don't pay me, just pay my travel costs. It's amazing. They'll go undercover and help us work with law enforcement around the world. You don't just rescue people. You help heal people. How do y'all do that? That is a very vibrant aftercare program that we have built. Uh, we're very transparent as you've you know gotten to know us. We did not do things very well on the aftercare side in our early days, 2014 into 2015. We trusted that the countries could take care of the kids once we rescued them. And just get you back home. Exactly, yeah. exactly. For instance, in the Dominican Republic, and again, not to throw them under the bus, they've become one of our best partners. 2014, we asked them, hey, how many kids on this particular operation can we rescue? Oh, I think probably 20 kids. We can take care of them. Okay, great. Set up the operation. We rescued 20 kids. Turned out they only had five beds available to help these kids. 15 of them went right back into it. We quickly changed. We stood down. We got an aftercare program set up. Now we will not work in a country unless we have vetted their aftercare facilities. We know what kind of treatment the women are going to get, and then we'll be able to move forward. It's not always great. I mean, look at child protective services in our country. It's difficult with resources and other things, but we really do focus on aftercare. And what's so amazing is now after these several years, the minors, the young kids we've been able to rescue are now of age, adults. They're able to tell their stories if they want. And what we talk about is we are able to move them along the spectrum from victim to survivor and survivor to thriver, and we'll stay with them as long as they want assistance. And we've had some really good success. I love that. You know, we talked earlier, 420 homes a year, yes. Pro probably, I'm going to say a million to 2 million people walking in that many homes. Mm -hmm. And literally the day that I'm, I'm listening to you the first time, I was like, that there, there's, there's something we can do. You know, how, how we work on that, how we, how we grow that, how we teach that is going to be interesting. But what should people look for? You know, you go back and you see the, the, the three ladies that, that were held hostage for years and years here. Yeah. And 
you, you look at that and you think, okay, somewhere along the way, a plumber, an electrician, somebody came to the house to fix something. Yes. And, and one thing that I was taught when you walk in the house, you hey, is there anywhere I can't go? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, there's a, a, a bedroom door back there with a deadbolt on it. You can't go in there. And me, after watching this, I'm like, yeah, at that point, I go to the back bathroom. I call 911. Yeah. Hey, I'm Roger. Uh, there may be a warrant out for me. You may want to come find me. Oh, by the way, when you get here, <laughs> uh, there's a bedroom you just may want to look in. <laughs> yeah. And, and, but if I'd have walked in the house before seeing your presentation or the second presentation of this movie, I may have never even thought that. Right. What can tradespeople look for? What just general signs walking in a house might tell them, hey, something doesn't smell right. You know, even just first off, and so many people say, Matt, you have all these special skills with the CIA and all the things you've done and talking your way in and out. What I always say is what I think is cool is I'm so in awe of people who can do things I can't. So plumbers, electricians, HVAC, absolutely amazing. The respect I have for these men and women in the service trade and the oftentimes that I need them to come out and help. So you think about how many times an, you know, a person goes in house 420. Let's say there's even just 5% chance or less of anything nefarious going on in those houses. You still have 20 opportunities or so to help yeah. in a year. So to your question, what I would say first and foremost is for people in your audience to know the vast majority of human trafficking and sexual exploitation in the United States does occur in hotels, motels, Airbnbs. However, oftentimes it is happening, happening in houses. I think this, the case you talked about was maybe in Cleveland, Ohio, something. I mean, for three years, these women are being held and you know, that's happening in other places around the world, around the country for sure. So what we say at Operation Underground Railroad is The eyes don't see what the mind doesn't know. So your men and women going in these, these, these houses, if their, if their mind doesn't know about trafficking, what to look for, their eyes will never see it. So what I always say is listen to your hunch, you know, listen to your gut feeling, listen to your sixth sense. If you will, if something doesn't feel right in that house, think about what does that mean? Is the owner, are they acting a little bit strange? Are they telling you a number of areas you can't go? And I love your question. And I hope that the service providers will go in and say, where all can I not go? You know, very respectful here. Where all can I not go? Yeah. And then they just, you know, listen to that. Keep an eye out for any kids. It could be boys, girls, men, women, but who are just kind of around. They may be behind locked doors, but they also may just kind of be sitting there on the TV, you know, watching TV and Cheerios waiting for the next client to come in. Anything weird about them, anything in their countenance, any, any tattoos, any crying, try to engage them in conversation. If they don't look you in the eye, if they don't talk, or if the man or whoever's the woman in the house say, answers for them, maybe that's something as well. Keep an eye out for any sexual paraphernalia around the house, any condoms, you know, trash, condom wrappers, sex toys. And again, I know it sounds kind of crazy, but just anything that looks out of place. And if you truly do just feel that there's something wrong, as you mentioned, call 911. There's also the National Anti-Human Trafficking Hotline. And we say 888-3737-888. Obviously, it's 888-373-7888, but kind of remember that, 888-373-7888. What they want you to do at the hotline is if you see something, say something, they would rather you call, they investigate, and there be nothing than you say, you know what, I'm probably just making stuff up. I'm not going to call and trouble anyone today, and you miss an opportunity to truly help someone. Yeah, I love that, and look, we'll put that number down in our comments, uh, in the description. Uh, I'll never forget it. All right. Eight 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 thirty seven thirty seven eight eight. There it is, right there. Yeah. Uh, I was in San Antonio, waiting to get in to Mitiros, one of my favorite restaurants. I love that restaurant, and man. Everybody does. Yes. If, if you don't know San Antonio, go. Yes, do it. And, and they were busy, and, and it was a wait, so that you know they give you the little beeper thing to stick in your pocket. And I, I walked down three or four doors down to this tequila bar, margarita bar, whatever it is, and it's packed, but there's room at the end. Well, I used to be a bartender, so I'm like, man, I'm standing there and drink a drink. I'm good. And I'm standing there drinking, there's, there's a guy sitting there, and it's one of those guys that's like, you just look at him and it's like, ugh. Something wrong, something off. And it didn't even click when it happened. It was after I walked off, after my, my pager went off, and I came back later, and he was gone. But the guy's literally sitting there, and there's a very cute girl and her husband, fiance, whatever, at the other end of the bar. And she's just one of those girl next door. She's a doll, she's loud, just a beautiful young lady. And out of the corner of my eye, I saw this guy take a picture of her. Huh. And, and, and I'm like, wait, why? You, you know, you're, 
If you don't know, you don't ask. And my mind's like, wait, why, why did he do that? And I'm watching. And about this time, my, my pager goes off. So I'm trying to close my tab and watch him and, and keep an eye on everything. And I keep watching and, and he's like making this picture bigger and he's doing this and he's tapping. And I thought, is, is he like shopping or, or, or selling or I, I look, right, yeah. there's somebody here. Y'all can come pick up or something. And that's the kind of things that after you learn about this, you start seeing stuff is like, wait, mm-hmm. why would somebody do that? Where are most people human trafficked from? So first and foremost in the United States, and I think that there's a little bit of a misunderstanding and a myth that trafficked individuals are only from elsewhere and coming across the border. That's obviously a big issue. Of course, in recent years, it's even become even more of an issue. But the vast majority of human trafficking victims in the United States are American citizens, American kids from broken homes, latchkey kids, kids that aren't getting the love that they need at home, or kids who need more. And what we always talk about is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And these groomers, these traffickers are going to fill those needs. Is it food, clothing, shelter? Is it a sense of belonging, love? Is it just being told you're beautiful? And these kids oftentimes are groomed into trafficking. And you mentioned this talking about the picture and, and, and putting it online. There is a real issue now with non-consensual pornography, non-consensual images. Again, I don't know in this case in Mitiera, but it could have been very well. He was just posting this. Maybe he gets paid for taking pictures of women who don't know because some guys have you know, these type of proclivities. Overseas, it is really the big tourist areas. So think about Thailand, Bangkok, or Phuket. Think about the Dominican Republic, Punta Cana. Think about Mexico, Cancun, Acapulco, places like that. It really is where tourists are going to go. Unfortunately, Americans... Are play a big role in this American men mostly, and again, it's just a very small percentage of American men. But there's a ton of American you know, men. Ten American men with so a small percentage. There's still a lot of people. Exactly, and Americans are the number one producer and consumer of child sexual abuse material. We used to call it child pornography. Now we say child sexual abuse material. Number one producer and consumer, followed by Canadians and Brits and Germans and Dutch. So that's that's kind of sort of where the Westerners, where the Westerners go. And in the United States, this can happen in New York and L.A., it can happen in Dallas, it can happen in Peoria, Illinois. It's everywhere. And that's what I think is great about shows like this is we can start to have people, again, become educated on this, have their antenna out, especially when service providers and those in the trades are going into homes because we are seeing more and more of this around the country. This can happen in uh, Asian massage parlors. This can happen in uh, you know nail salons, forced labor. And that's another thing, too, is... When these men and women in your audience, too, they go into these, these, it, these houses, it might not just be commercial sexual exploitation. There may be people there housed for forced labor. So do you see people in the house who don't speak English, who, again, seem like they're just, there's something not right? Go ahead maybe and call authorities as well just to investigate because oftentimes what you see is that the, the people are being held in these houses to then be forced to work in some of these, again, nail salons, other places, agricultural industry in California, Texas. It's just unfortunately a problem that's really getting worse. Where are most people taken from? Are they taken from the United States too as much as other countries? Yeah, so again, in the trafficking in the United States, you're most likely going to have, again, American citizens in, again, topless you know, dance bars, table dance, being uh, pimped out online, escorts. However, you are seeing more foreigners, especially over the past few years. And what you're seeing as well now is after the COVID pandemic and the lockdowns and people are in their homes for 18 months or two years, the um, number of incidences of online pornography use just skyrocketed. People with their phones, their laptops. Well, what has happened is after people have been looking at pornography for a while, that's not enough to get them the dopamine hit the rush. They then have to become what are called contact offenders. They are then now looking for quote unquote prostitutes, sex workers. And so you see advertised in websites, barely legal, right? It's just this backpage.com that used to right. be around. Then again, most of these are going to be American kids. However, you're seeing more and more of the foreigners. As Operation Underground Railroad, when we go into different countries, in our rescue operations, for the most part, we are rescuing kids from that country. Thai kids in Thailand, even though you have from Burma and from uh, Malaysia and, and surrounding countries. And in Latin America, we are rescuing kids mostly from that country. However, and you mentioned it earlier, because of the economic situation in Venezuela, Colombia, elsewhere, we're starting to see girls from those countries wind up in Central America, Mexico, even the Southern Cone in South America. What's the youngest child you've ever seen? 
So the youngest child I have ever seen in one of these operations has been 10 years old. However, Tim and some of the other heroes in Homeland Security, and again, I, uh, I, I, I'm just going to say it, right? It's, uh, it turns your stomach, but four years old, five years old, six Jesus. years old, yeah, Jesus. online. And what kind of depravity, Roger? I mean, our country, our world, what is going on? It doesn't just make you think, what, what is going on? They're reaching out to kids through social media. Exactly. They're, they're making them promises of things the kids want, mm-hmm. their needs, mm-hmm. wants and desires that maybe their parents aren't. Mm-hmm. This can happen to anybody. Yes. That's why I want trace people to think about this. A year from now, it could be their kid that they're looking for. Like, wait. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I love that part in the movie. The dad's name is Pedro. Yes. He looks at, I think it's Tim. It is, yeah. The Jim Caviezel says, character, yeah. If your kid wasn't in bed that night, mm-hmm. what would you be doing? Yeah. What would you be sleeping? Yes. But, you know, there's a lot of comments going around. Uh, there's, there's a lot of good and bad. Right. But, mo- most of it's good. This is amazing. Right. But now people are like, oh, well, they're doing that because they're finally getting a chip funded or something. They're doing this because this. I'm like, no, guys, look, I've known this guy five years. This has been working and trying oh, yeah. to get it done. Exactly. Sony, I think, originally did this or maybe it, it, it was, had something so to do Fox with Fox initially, then Disney bought him out and Disney didn't want anything to do with it. And we looked at Sony, we looked up, but they didn't want anything to do with it. Finally, Angel Studios came along and said, yep, you can, you can say God, you can pray, you can keep the religious aspect, we're keeping it as is. Angel Studios, of course, behind The Chosen. Yes. One of my YouTube coaches, Daryl Eves, is an executive producer for Oh, that's for them. amazing. I love it. Uh, so, I mean, I've, I've got chills under my shirt. <laughs> but when, when I saw that, so, so Disney bought it. Disney bought Fox. It was a Fox movie in Fox Latin America. That's originally how it was set up. Because remember, this all started script writing 2017, filming in 2018. And it got put on the shelf. It's like, yeah, we're never releasing that. They didn't want to see it. Hollywood didn't want anybody to see this. Disney didn't want anybody to see this. Tomb Raider, whatever the show is out right now that it beat. Yeah, Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones. Yeah. yeah. A Disney movie, right? A Disney movie. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm not saying anything. No, 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 I'm, I'm you know? not either. I'm just like, hey, hey if, it, <laughs> right. if, if, if it looks like a black Yeti, it's, or, it's not a Yeti, so I'm not going to say that. <laughs> but, but I mean, Netflix didn't want to show it. Right. We asked them. What was their reasoning? Was it? Hey, you're, there's too much religion in here, too much mm-hmm. God in here. This is things people don't want to watch, things people don't want to see. Right. Too dark, it they said. It turns your stomach. It, yep. But look at the, can I say crap? Look at the yeah, crap. Absolutely. Look at the crap that they do put out. It's uh, yeah. not too dark for them. It still turns your stomach. Said, exactly. And they wouldn't do this. I, I've been wanting two years. How, how do I get involved? How do I, I help? know? I, I remember you people? and I have been talking. Yeah. And is there going to be another one? So right now there is talk of Sound of Freedom 2, where that would be the search for Guardi. And what I want to say quickly is when you mentioned that line from Pedro, the father in the movie, if you knew one of your bed kids bed was, was empty at night, if you knew one of your kids were there, could you sleep? So that's an actual line from the father of Gardy. Gardy is a Haitian American citizen. We've been looking for him since 2013, 2014. Pretty much where it started. Exactly. That's how operation underground railroad really started. And that's going to be kind of sound of freedom too. You know, Tim adopted a couple of kids from Haiti uh, we have not found Guardi yet, but what we say is there's the Guardi effect because because of Guardi, we launch Operation Underground Railroad. We have not found him yet, but the Guardi effect is we've been able to help in the rescue of over 7,000 children and adult victims of trafficking, and we give Guardi the credit. You bet. So that's going to be sort of the Sound of Freedom 2, but this Sound of Freedom 1 now, and I really hope that if people haven't seen it, you go see it. It's only going to be in theaters, I think, maybe a few more days. And Why only a few more days? Is it, it's a, a limited release? So it originally was set up for a limited release from about July 3rd through the 13th. Well, pack theaters, number one for oh, several yeah. of the days. So now it's been extended. What I've seen is through about July 20 or 21. I believe it will still go longer because people are continuing to go. But there is just a lot of resistance. And you asked about that earlier. And again, I'm not going to get into conspiracy theories, but you mentioned early on a lot of politicians involved in this, a lot of big tech involved in this. This is, there's a reason why OUR has been shadow banned, why uh, we used to have so many followers. Now we're reduced. We're grateful now with the movie, we're getting about 10,000 new followers a day. So thank you. And if any of the tradespeople are listening to this, thank you so much. OURrescue.org. People are coming to the cause, but it is an uphill battle and we've gotten mostly positive reviews. As you know, there's always criticism, but here's what we think. Look, we let that kind of roll off our back. If there's legitimate criticism, we'll make some changes as we always have, but we're not going to sit here and just listen to these people just natter on about, oh, it's a conspiracy. They're just doing this and that. And it's all about no, as you mentioned, you and I met years ago. I've been doing this now for eight or nine years, and even with the government before that. This is a real 
real issue. And in the movie, one of these days it's come going to come for the likes of you. That's what one of the characters says. And we can get to what you're talking about earlier with, with tradespeople, what they can do to, to protect their kids and grandkids. Because again, one of these days, it unfortunately will come for the likes of all of us. Well, and, and let's talk about that because it does to me, the reason I want to be involved, I've got grandkids. Mm-hmm. I've got two granddaughters that I, I've told people before, if they were gone, I, yeah, I would not sleep. I would be. You'd go all Liam Neeson yeah, on it probably. Yeah, huh? yeah, yeah, yeah. Good luck. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 it's like, I, I, don't, I don't know how I'm going to find you, but, but I'm going to find you. Mm-hmm. But that's me. I, I'm driven like that. I'm like, look, when, when I set my mind to it, I, I'm in. A lot of parents aren't like that. A lot Correct. of parents are like, look, I, I don't know what to do. I'm just, yeah. I'm going to sit here. I'm going to cry. I'm, I'm not going to get out of yeah. bed. Yeah. Or I'm going to stick my head in the sand, which is understandable. I'm not blaming anyone. You bet. No, 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 and that. even the ones that they lay in bed, look, we all handle things different. Yes. And I get that. I'm the guy that's like, yeah, I hadn't slept in four weeks, but, but I'm getting close. Mm-hmm. You know, what can parents do for their children, their yeah. grandkids? Yeah. What can they do to make sure that, and, and, and there's no way to make sure. There, Correct. There's, there's no 100% Correct. guarantee on that. No anything. 100%, but you can do a lot. Absolutely. What, what, can, what should every parent do today? Just to say, look, step number one, let's do this. Yeah. I think there's a lot of room for optimism because there are a lot of things you can do. The first thing is having the conversation with your child or your grandchild. And what I always say is, parents, you know what's best for your kids. Isn't that crazy nowadays in our country, the way it's going, that actually parents know what's best for your kids? Yeah. Parents, you know what's best for your kids. You will know whether you need to scare your kids or treat them with kid gloves or go right down the middle. But you need to tell your kids that, there is evil out there. It's not to scare you. It's not to make you not want to live your life and be happy. However, just know that things are out there. So what types of things? Well, first and foremost, the biggest danger kids are going to face, it's not a white panel van driving by and scooping them up when they're going to the mall. I mean, you have to be careful when you go to a place like that. It's online. It's the information you put out. It's the friend requests you accept from strangers. What I always say is, and tell your child, you might, you know, have a, a, a someone gives you offers, gives you a friend request, and their profile picture is a good-looking guy like Zac Efron or something. Unless you physically know that person, you don't know if that is a 16-year-old boy or a 55-year-old man. So first and foremost, be careful about who you're accepting friend requests from. How much information are you sharing online? Don't share any personal information you wouldn't want all over the Dallas Morning News and New York Times, anything like that. But also that you wouldn't want anyone else to know anything embarrassing. Don't put any pictures up there that you wouldn't want splashed over the internet. I have my daughter sometimes, you know, they have pictures of them f- with their friends and they're wearing bikinis in the pool. And I'm saying nowadays with Photoshop and artificial intelligence, you that's why you talk about, exactly. Yep. So being careful about that. And it's a stereotype, but for those who have boys and online gaming with strangers, I would never say don't play online gaming with strangers. I would say don't talk to the strangers about anything not related to the game. Hey, Fortnite, good call, good weapon. Okay, soccer, great shot, football, hey, great play. Hey, what school do you go to? I don't talk about that. Hey, do you play football? I don't talk about that. Because these groomers can take little bits and pieces of information and put together a pattern of life, and that's when they start grooming you. And all they need is one little compromising photo, one little uh, agreement to meet, and then they can reel you into their network. One last thing, and then we can continue dialogue for parents. Let your child know that if anything ever happens to them that's embarrassing to them, maybe they make a mistake. Maybe they do send a picture. It's okay. They can come to you. You're not going to yell at them or they're not going to get in trouble because what the traffickers are hoping is that the kid will be so embarrassed, they'll never tell their parents. But the minute that you come to your parents, then the parents can go to law enforcement. They can go and talk to other uh, others. One last thing, I'll give you a resource because I know you can put it down on the screen. Cybertipline.org. Cybertipline.org. If you find that some of your material is on the internet, they help you get it off. If there's a, if you receive a, a sext message that you don't want, don't delete it right away because what if law enforcement is tracking that? Post it on the cybertipline.org. You report it and then you can delete it. There are lots of resources out there. And the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children through their website, NetSmarts, N-E-T-S-M-A-R-T-Z, NetSmarts.org. Wonderful videos and resources that are age appropriate from, I think, age three up through college. The world's changed a lot from when you and I were young. Yeah. It's changed a lot. Social media, you, you said y'all been shadow banned. Oh, yes. I've, I've been shadow banned. I don't, don't even know what for. Can't even imagine. I that. know. I know. When I posted 
that, that I was having you on a friend of mine says, Roger, I just had, I just lost my LinkedIn channel. Uh, he's a podcaster. He mm-hmm. actually wants to interview you. Perfect. And he was, he, the, the subject came up and he had seen the movie and just his, one of his things that he said to me, he says, look, Pedro ought to be punched in the face. You don't just carry your kids and drop them off like that. Yeah. Okay. But a lot of parents do that. They're like, look, this is what my kid wants. This, right. I met this person. They, they are going to make my daughter famous. Yeah. And that's, that's the stories. And he literally, he's like, look, I, I never punched Pedro in the face. You know, by the end of the movie, you're crying for him. Exactly. But at that time, and of course, I, I knew where it was headed because, mm-hmm. because I, I know what's going on. Right. I know what the movie's about. And I'm saying, Pedro, damn, don't do that. Yeah. But we don't always know that. And they sell some great stories mm-hmm. when, when they go to these and I'm gonna call them third world countries and say, look, you can't get a job over here. I can get you a job in Colombia. Oh yeah. Model, au pair yes. girl, restaurant bar. Absolutely. You are going to make more money mm-hmm. and sound of freedom was about kids, but now we're talking adults Correct. that have families at home. Yes. They have children at home and they bring their passport to the airport and Climbing a first class flight, right? The beautiful woman sitting exactly. next to them who's like, I'm gonna show you everything I did. Mm-hmm. Painting and this you, image. How can you say no to that? Yeah, you're you're gonna you're gonna make millions. And they get over there and they take their passports from them. Right. And then they tell them, Well, look, you gotta pay all this money back. And here's how you're gonna and do it. And here's how you're gonna do it. One of the articles or, or things that I read, a pimp can make hundred and fifty to two hundred thousand dollars a year. Mm-hmm. off each person doing what basically nothing he doesn't have to do anything he just lets the money roll in as these poor women turn in two three times an hour horrible and they keep telling them well you owe us for your flight you owe us for your food your mm-hmm. rent your clothes your makeup mm-hmm. and that bill continues to get bigger your every, food every, every day. single day your lodging they could have a crappy mattress on the floor but that's lodging you're paying 50 bucks or more a day it's called debt bondage and they never get out of it. Mm-mm, you know, if I can mm-mm. say one thing we talked yes, about earlier, right? Yeah. We want to punch Pedro in the face, but what I think about sound of freedom is so powerfully done. And in that scene, and I hope the trades people listening, if you haven't seen it, we'll go see it in the beginning. You can tell Pedro knows something's wrong when this oh, yeah, model Giselle, so, hesitant. so yes. hesitant, but he looks at his beautiful daughter who looks up at him with the eyes. Remember how many of us with kids have not had daddy, please every, it's my favorite thing. And that's what I thought was so heartbreaking, but powerful because who's to say, I probably would have done the same thing. We'd be like, okay, baby, whatever for you. But that is how these groomers, they prey on the kids, get the parents, and then you see what happens. You, you met my son a while ago. Yes. I remember when he was a kid, he fell, and he was running up some steps, and he fell, and he, he busted his cheek. He's going to have to get some stitches. Okay. And by the time I get to the hospital, they, they've got him strapped down on a papoose. They, they've got his arms strapped down. They've got his head strapped down. And Boy, he looks up at me and sees me, and he's like, Daddy, get me out here. And the doctor looks at me and says, help hold him. I said, no, I got to walk out Yeah, because yeah. I'm either going to hurt you or walk out. One, yeah, one, one of the exactly. other. Exactly. And, you and, can't and I'm, see just, your I'm a dad. Like I can't, I can't say no to that. And we do, we, we want to give our kids the world mm-hmm. and they literally come in and make the, these children and women think I'm, I'm going to give you the world. That's right. Image versus reality. We always say you bet. And when they come into a country to bring women out. Mm -hmm. How many women do they bring out at a time? Or is it just like, is it one at a time? Always we're working on one. I mean, think about it. If you could make $200,000 off of a a person, right? You don't need to grab a whole lot of them a year to, 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 to make a great living. Exactly. How many people, 2 million people are involved in this? Right. At children, it's estimated. Yeah. Between two and 5 million UNICEF estimates that. So to your question, what we've seen, and again, it's just one group, Operation Underground Railroad has seen, but we oftentimes see traffickers kind of preying on one at a time. Now, maybe go in, and again, this is just, you have a smooth-talking guy with a nice Armani suit, Rolex watch, would go into a country such as Romania, um, the, the, the former Soviet Union, and have, you know, find a, a beautiful girl and go in to the house, single mom, maybe, you know, say, hey, your daughter's beautiful. I could take her with me to London, to Paris, to New York, to LA and make her a model. Or, hey, she could be an au pair girl or she could be famous. Here's $500 he'll give her. More money than she'll see an entire year. Oh, yeah. 
Come with me. Well, just like in the movie, ah, there's something that doesn't feel right. My spidey senses are up here. I don't know. And then look at the daughter. Daughter's either excited. Yeah, I want to do it. And so she wants to do, say yes for that reason. Or maybe she's like, uh, if my daughter stays here in whatever country, she has no chance. If I let her go there, maybe she has a chance. But then it's, as you say, the passport's taken, she's gone. So in a real world situation, and we talked about it, is this operation in Haiti. 10 Venezuelan women in a brothel in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, the most obscure place in the most, one of the most obscure countries in the world. These women were beautiful. They were smart, successful, and yet they still were lured from Venezuela because there was no jobs. There were no jobs from them. The socioeconomic conditions were such they had no chance. So the women would tell us later, I mean, some of these college educated, some of them had their own businesses. One was former law enforcement officer, but they had zero economic chance and in, in possibility. They had kids and mouths to feed, and they were lured in by this image. They get to Santo Domingo in the Dominican Republic. Passports are taken. They're drugged. They wake up the next day in Port-au-Prince, and that then becomes their life. This happens all over the world. But again, it doesn't have to be that sophisticated because can you imagine a trafficker in the United States? Let's just say where we are in North Texas. You go to a mall. You go to a movie theater, a Walmart. Uh, uh, the, we say DART. It's the area of rapid transit here in Dallas. Who's out of place? On a Wednesday at one in the afternoon, they should be at school. Who's okay? Ah, let me go over and talk about them. Talk to them. They find their vulnerabilities. Little by little, they groom them in just by meeting their needs. And it may be, again, something as simple as saying, you're the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. I can make you a model. I imagine the tradespeople now listening, this, they could relate because it's the same as my situation. I have two wonderful daughters. I think I've given them a good childhood. I think that I've, I've taught them everything. However, one of them in particular, if someone came up to him and said, you're the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. I can make you famous online. I think she'd probably say, tell me more. Right? <laughs> yeah, Does that exactly. make sense? Here's my number. Exactly. Don't call my dad whatever you do because exactly. he'll kill me. And this, I think I've warned her. She has a dad who's CIA and Operation Underground Railroad. You probably would say, trades people in your audience listening. So again, none of us are immune to this. But as long as we have these talks with our kids, I really think that's half the battle. I'll tell you a cool story because I was... I talk about Operation Underground Railroad a lot. Thank and I'm you. at a social media conference. And, and there's this young lady there, beautiful lady, used to be a, a cheerleader for one of the in, in NFL team, something like that. And after we started talking about human trafficking and, and everything going on, she told me a story. She said her and a friend of hers got in a car. They had flown somewhere. And wherever it was they were headed, they're waiting in line. And this guy walks up and says, hey, look, my fair Castled. I got a limousine right here. I'm headed into town. Can, can I give you all a ride? And, you know, she's like, uh, and her friend's like, oh, God, yeah, we don't want to wait in that line. <laughs> limousine. So they hop in, throw their luggage in the back, and they're driving down the road, and she's already put it in the map. She, she's a smart young lady. Right. Already put it in the map as to where they're going. And the guy comes up and gets in the right hand lane and says, hey, we, we got to go by. I got to go by and make a stop real quick. The girl says, oh, no, no. You're headed to the hotel. He says, no, no, no. It, it, it won't take but a minute. So she picks up her phone. She says, hey, dad, you're right. It's happening now. Make it happen. And gets off to this guy's like, what, 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 what are you doing? She says, you have no idea who you picked up. And he said, what do you mean? He says, my father works for Apple. There's a tracking in here that he can link to the police department. Within two minutes, you're going to have 50 police cars behind wow. you. Wow. And she stops. He jerks back over in the lane, comes up, says whenever they pulled up in front of the hotel, he literally opened the door because, of course, at the stop sign, she's trying to open the door. The doors won't open. Mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness. He gets out, goes in the back, takes their luggage and throws it out. Wow. Opens the door and they get out. And she said, you're lucky you brought, it, you brought us here. And he said, you'll see me again. Now, she didn't. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, how do you teach people to have that kind of mind? Look, smart. I mean. I'm listening to her and I've got chills. Absolutely. I'm like, girl, yeah, I do as well. Amazing. Right. How do you teach people to have that mindset of, look, I'm not going to be a victim. Right. Because it, it's a mindset. You've got to tell yourself, I'm, I'm not going to let that happen to me, my kids, whatever it is. And you got to think about it 100% of the time. Exactly. Well, first, you know, I'd say, and that's a big risk, I think, right? Even to get into limousine. So you something bet. like that is just make sure no one would ever do that. But then even taking normal taxi rides, other things. I love that you said she put it in maps. That's what I said. Always be true. We go overseas. Always track. Know where you're going. <laughs> know where you're going. 
And, you know, we won't get too deep into this, but what we do is for our operators at Operation Underground Railroad, we have them have the color scheme. It's the Cooper color codes you may have heard. Code white is oblivious or when you're home resting. Code yellow is just a little bit of of awareness, kind of like when you're defensive driving. That's what you will always want to be in that state when you're out and about because that's for when a threat is possible. Then let's say a threat is probable, like what happened in the limousine when all of a sudden he goes and makes the turn. Now you're in code orange. That state of alert is when you're driving again, but more like on ice and hail and rain where you're totally focused. And then code red, of course, is when you've got to fight. But if you're in code white, if those two girls in the limousine had been in code white, talk in Snapchat and social media, oh, yeah. they would have never known where they would have gone. So this is what for parents to tell your kids always to be aware and then always have that number, emergency number 911 on your phone or to call dad, call whoever, even if you have to make it up, right? Because I don't know if this girl was telling the truth or not, she made that up. Exactly. If you're listening, be way to go. Exactly. For sure. Yeah. And be the right thing. So parents, talk to your kids about it. For our kids, it was always, if you ever get in any type of situation, you can just text, put in a letter X somewhere that just out of place. It makes it look like a typo and we'll come run it. Parents can come up with their kids for, with different strategies, but use them. Have your kids be confident and use the strategies if they get into scraps like that. How do we make human trafficking out? Well, I think first of all, it's podcasts like this. It shows like this because we need awareness. First and foremost, we need people to realize this is trafficking, not prostitution. These are victims. These aren't volunteers. Movies like Sound of Freedom, documentaries like Triple Take that will come out, Sage's Prayer, Angel Studios is actually going to put out our documentaries after the theater has, has made, made a run. And I hope we have time real quick is it's men really have to take a stand. So again, tradespeople now, male tradespeople are listening to this. We as men have to rally other men because it's only, again, a small percentage of men who would buy another human being, but a lot of men around the world. You bet. And again, I use myself as an example. I'm not sitting here, Roger, with this halo over my head. Oh, I always used to know this. No, I wish someone would have told an 18-year-old Matt Osborne that this was trafficking, even 25-year-old. I'm embarrassed to say I went to some guys' nights, bachelor parties at oh, strip oh, clubs because yeah, oh, yeah. uh, I thought- but Most that, of us have done that. Exactly. And if I would have known, because some will say, oh, no, they, they choose, to, they're of age, they choose to go. Is it really a choice if that's the only option you have because- your stepfather abused you when you were eight years old because you got hooked on drugs because of that, because, because, because you have a criminal record. And so that's the only, is that really a choice? But too many of us, I think men who are like, no, it's an even trade. I want their body or want to see their body. They want my money. I think we realize that. And once we realize that we can end the demand and that's what it's going to take. Why is it that I've on 24 different occasions with Operation Underground Railroad gone into countries with our teams and within minutes I'm approached and on a beach, tourist area, everyone, you know, from they want to sell me a shell necklace, pack of cigarettes, jet ski ride, parasail, to drugs, to girls. Yep. It happens that fast. Anything Why is that? you want. That's what they say. Anything, anything you want. I can, and if it's not them, they'll say, I can get you anything you want. Yep. How many times have people offered you, me, right? People in the audience when you're, when you're traveling. And why is that? It's because they know there's a demand. If we as men can rise up and realize that we've got to attack the demand one day, and I know it's down in the future, one day there won't be any supply. And I think that's how we end this. Trades people walking into houses. You, you gave a couple of places they can call a while ago. Right. And while you were talking about it, I thought of Teddy Bear sitting in the back seat of the car, yep. holding the bear, mm -hmm. going through Check the border point. patrol. Yep. And you look at his face. You can tell there's something wrong. Mm-hmm. Talked about Pedro. Yeah, you know, my spotty senses kick, kick in. Look, something's not right here. Right. And then when he goes back and knocks on the door, and nobody answers. Mm -hmm. And he starts beating on doors up and down the hallway. There's nobody there. Yeah. And the look of horror on oh, his yeah. face. Oh, yeah. N number one, people that have not seen it, go see it. Go see it quickly. Why a limited release? Just, I, I, and, and I don't know, you said that a while ago, and I thought, I don't know that I've ever heard of a movie being released. Hey, we're only going to run this for one month. Mm-hmm understand it or could understand it in a way right where does it go to after it's out is right. it going somewhere else to can, can somebody sent me a bootleg copy the other day and says hey look watch this because if you don't go to the can't, if they take it out of the movies right the way they worded it and i'll reply back don't send me this crap exactly hey, you yeah. go watch the movie exactly that there's money involved and the money needs to go where it needs to go for a reason and it, 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 anyway it's a very heated conversation yeah but what happens when it gets pulled out? Correct. Are people going to be able to see this somewhere else? Yeah. Or are we going to be able to 
share it and talk about mm-hmm. it and, and things like that. So first of all, limited release because it was a limited budget and because there was initial resistance from some theaters. And again, I'm not going to comment on the different theater chains because they have stepped up. They've done a great job. But that's what it was set for. We're going to see how this goes for about a two-week period. Well, of course, now it's extended. Theaters want it. I believe it's still going to run for a couple more weeks. But then what's really cool is I think a couple things will happen. They're now going to take it around the world. At Operation Underground Rail, we have our little hotline, our email, and our phone number. People are calling from Canada, where it now is in Canada. Australia, not yet there. UK. Then, as you remember, it's kind of almost half in Spanish, half in English. So we're going to run this through Latin America. Um, the Sound of Freedom did an amazing job, their producers and directors, in getting actors who are famous in different countries. So Giselle, the woman who plays the model, famous Cuban actor. It's funny her name is Giselle. Yes. Just, you know. Yeah, exactly. That's right. And the island, right? Even uh-huh. though, as we said, this was filmed two out of 18, but I think God works in mysterious Absolutely. ways. That's all I'm saying. Absolutely. You're right. Um, Fuego, he's a famous uh, Dominican Republic uh, actor and others. So that's going to go through. Then Angel Studios, my understanding, is going to put it on the Angel app, kind of like we can which watch The I, Chosen. Which I have on my phone. Exactly. So then it will be there as well. So it is going to be able to, to be seen. Operation Underground Railroad does not get any of the proceeds from the movie, but we've had a lot of people come to our website. And we've had a lot of people ask about this. We are going to continue to team up with them. Then on the documentaries that I mentioned, the first documentary Angel Studios will put out in about maybe September, October, it's called Operation Triple Take. That is the real life story of Sound of Freedom. And it even has the part you mentioned earlier, remember with Dennis DeJesus, the guy who was saving up his money to go to Cartagena. We tell that story and how that kind of kicked off the whole triple take, which then led to the island rescue, which then led to Sound of Freedom. Do you take your family on vacations? Uh, I do not as much now as I would like. And I always get a little nervous and I will tell you, and maybe this is where you're going with the question. My wife and two college age daughters now say, dad, you can never turn it off when you're on vacation. We love going to Mexico, Cancun, Los Cabos, but I'm taking them to the beach and I'll I'll say, Ooh, that looks like a sketchy location. Ooh, we may need to take that down. Ooh, let's investigate that. They get dad, relax, have a drink and go to the beach. And that's exactly why I asked. I I used to do security here at Starplex. Mm -hmm. And now no matter when I go to a concert, where I sit at a concert, who the concert, it, it doesn't matter. I'm constantly, you know, you, oh, yeah. you you're in at, code yellow, you, you code orange, everybody. Cause you know, look, look, it, it can always happen mm-hmm. when you go on vacation with, with, with your daughters, anything special, you tell them, you know, Hey, keep your eyes open. Think about this. Do you keep them in code yellow or do they know, Hey, this is where I'm supposed to be. I think now they know they're in code yellow or to be in code yellow. It took them a while to get there. But, and again, they make fun of me because I still always sit with my back, look, you know, at the back of the wall, looking out. I'll still, always. as I come up to the car, I'll kind of look underneath, make sure everything's good. I still back in tactically. I saw you, you did earlier too. That's what we do. Um, but I also make sure they have the U.S. Embassy number in the different countries. My daughter's actually in Europe right now. She's had a couple of European trips this, this summer jobs. You know darn well, she's got the embassy number. She's got our numbers just in case. And we've got the trackers, the air tags, all of that. Again, it's walking that fine line. With my daughters now, I can kind of scare them, sort of, quote unquote. I know some parents may not be able to, but it's this idea of how do you just let them have a healthy awareness, or as we joke with the CIA used to teach us, functional paranoia. You're always paranoid, but you can still function and live your life. I think now in this day and age with the way our world's going, I'd recommend everyone in your audience to live with that mentality and to teach your kids and grandkids to have that as well. You know, one thing you just talked about, air tags, and I'll give you Operation Underground uh, an idea. Sell jewelry. And I thought, remember the St. Timoteo? Yeah. The Timoteo, the dog tag, the necklace. It stayed with the girl. She gave it to the boy. Mm-hmm. Built something with chips in it. And, and I'm not, I don't mean chips like to put on no, humans. I know what you mean. Yeah, But, hey, this is how you track. You can register your necklace mm-hmm. and... Call Tim, and Tim can say, here's where your child is. Here's where that necklace is right now. Yeah. Uh, anyway, just just something jumped in yeah, my mind. that's a good idea. And that's a true story. You know that necklace. Uh, I know. That actually I, happened. And, and it's I thought incredible. That, that's, that stayed with yes. one of them. Yep. This, to me, is something, especially if, if they've seen the movie, if they've seen the clips you've done, uh, anything that I've seen, it, it makes you think about it all the time. Right. If there was one thing that you could tell any tradesperson that that's maybe listening this morning on their way into work, if they walk into a house, just kind of cover what should they look at, mm-hmm. 
what should they think about? Tradespeople have an amazing opportunity to be on the front lines in the battle against human trafficking because they will likely at some point in their careers be let into a house where bad things are going on. And the owner of the house or whoever's running things is never in a million years going to think that that tradesperson will have his or her antenna up, his or her eyes open. I would say to these individuals, when you go into a house, you will probably have a feeling that something just isn't right. Instead of just dismissing it like, okay, let me just do my job and and, and go to the next call. Just take a second. Obviously, don't act like, you know, Mission Impossible, dun, 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 (laughs) dun, dun, dun. dun, dun. Don't be picking the locks, trying to get in the room to see what's going on. But again, ask the owner, where am I not allowed to go? I want to respect your home. Again, you sort of be a little obsequious. You sort of be a little bit talking to them. Again, to lure lure them in, lull them into, into complacency. But pay attention to what they say. Is it certain rooms in certain areas? And then maybe find a way to kind of walk by there, just sort of check it out. Look at the individuals in the house. Listen, or do you hear people behind the doors? Again, the sexual paraphernalia, look around. Is it just something that looks a little crazy? Don't act like it's triggering anything on you, but maybe be ready to call 911. Maybe be ready to call the National Human Trafficking Hotline, local law enforcement, and be honest and say, look, I do not want to waste your time. However, there were some really weird things in this house. I would rather you investigate and nothing happened than for me not to say anything and have a chance to miss someone. And again, it may just be one person in your audience in their entire career, but that is one opportunity not miss to truly save a child and help someone get out of a human trafficking situation. There are some websites you gave to. OURrescue.org, OurRescue.org has uh, signs of trafficking, what to look for. But if you're just looking for how to keep your kid or grandkids safe, netsmarts.org, N-E-T-S-M-A-R-T-Z.org, and kidsmarts, with again a Z, .org. National Center for Missing and Exploited Children has put together resources age appropriate. Parents, grandparents, look at those resources, look at the videos, and you will know which ones to share with your child or grandchild. That is really a great way to arm them to keep themselves safe. And finally, parents, grandparents, let your kids know that if someone makes you an offer that seems too good to be true, it probably is. Pay attention to that. Tell a parent or a trusted adult, you won't get in trouble, child or grandchild. The worst thing you could do is not saying anything, and then the trafficker would have you in his grasps. If a girl sent an inappropriate pic to somebody and it ended up online, mm-hmm. what can she do to help get that off? There is another website too, and thanks for asking, cybertipline.org, cybertipline.org. There's a way you can report it. They'll help you scrub a lot of that material off. Look, we all make mistakes. So maybe someone sends a picture, shouldn't have done it. All right, that's okay. Let's make, let's, let's try to rectify it. But again, as we mentioned earlier, and this is stuff still, it's above my head because it's still be over my head because it's still being uh, played out. AI, Photoshop, you may send an innocuous picture. You may not have done anything wrong, but somehow a picture making it look like you're nude or in some sort of compromising position could be on the internet. Cybertipline.org can also help you get that off of that, off of there. Yeah, it's really funny. I, I watched, there's a YouTuber named Peter McKenna, who's an amazing photographer, videographer, and all this. And he literally did a video the other day, and he shows this picture. And he's like, can you go through and tell you know, what's AI and what's real and all this? And you look at this picture, you're like, okay, this is beautiful. Mm-hmm. And he goes through and strips it down. It's, it's a picture he took of a, a shack. Scary. And he used AI to, to do all this stuff around it. And, and I mean, there were 11 different things that he did to this picture to change it and enhance it. And that's why when you said somebody takes a picture of you in a swimsuit, you know what? They can make you look naked in about 10 seconds. Yeah. It doesn't take that long to do it. This has been great. Uh, I've, I've loved this. Operation Underground Railroad is doing great things. Thank you. Uh, not just rescuing, but, but helping rehabilitate. After help, Helping get them home and comfortable and, and, and things like that. And I know people that, that want to donate. We, we, we will have the, the link down in the, in the description. It's, a, it's big right now at the, at the theaters. Yes. And you were in the movie, and I, I was like, <laughs> that's Matt. Three-second like, roll, uh, three hey, seconds. Hey, hey, I saw it. I saw it. <laughs> You signed up in a CIA right after 2001. 9-11. What would you go back and tell yourself the day you walked into the CIA the first time? If you could talk to, to Matt, who was finally getting to come in to the job he wanted to do, what would you tell Matt that day? I would have pushed back a little harder against some of the politicization of the intelligence and I work for both a Republican and Democrat. I work for George W. Bush. I work for Barack Obama.
but in each administration, we're told to speak truth to power. And we did on occasions, writing the president's daily brief, briefing president's national security officers. And yet still, some of my bosses at the higher levels worked to change my analysis, my opinion, my assessments based on what they thought either President Bush or President Obama wanted to hear. I wish I would have pushed back and said, we have to continue to tell, speak truth to power. It wasn't rampant. It was just a few right. occasions, but I think I would have done that. That's what the American people deserve. Their taxpayers, their hard-earned money that goes to taxes to pay our salaries, that's what they deserve. I wish I would have pushed back a little bit harder on that. Okay. You quit that job. I did. You went to work with Tim Ballard. Mm-hmm. What would you go back and tell Matt? the day he walks into Operation Underground Railroad the first day? I think it would have been great to have had the, the crystal ball to look, look ahead. Yeah, we don't get that. Exactly. We don't. That I wish, and, and we talked about a little earlier on the program, is I wish we would have come in for focus first and foremost on aftercare. But again, Tim was Homeland Security. I was CIA. We had Navy SEALs and Green Berets. We weren't focused on that. It was only a few months, but yet I think we, we could have done a better job saving and really rescuing some kids earlier that fell through the cracks. That still to this day bothers me and haunts me. However, we can't change the past. We can focus on the future. And God has blessed us with an opportunity to really make a difference and have made a difference in the lives of so many. But I think I would have gone back and said, look, these countries where we're working, they don't have the aftercare infrastructure in place. We need to focus on that. We did in 2015-16 start, and to this day now we're really doing a lot, but I think that's how I would answer your question. Matt, I've heard you speak twice. Uh, I've got to see you in a movie. <laughs> I appreciate everything you're doing. Thank well, you. Likewise. Thanks to you, and thanks to the great trades people listening in. And again, we'll just pray that they will see something someday, be able to say something, be able to save someone. Amen. And I don't remember if it was in the movie or if I saw it the other day. God's children are not for sale. In the movie, God's children are not for sale. And another line too, never trust a pedophile. God, no <laughs> doubt. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir.